tell us something about farming that you think people don't know. Farmers online make it look glamorous. We, 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 are, we are guilty for that. Farming is hard. Farming is demanding. Farming will take away all your social life. And it's either you're going in deep and doing it, or you don't do it at all because you lose money. It's the, one, it's the one game where it's either you win or you lose. It's a gamble, you know? But also gambling is, is smart. You gamble, you gamble smart, you win. Is it lucrative for you? Yes, farming is very lucrative for me. If it wasn't, I wouldn't be doing it. Well done. Well done. It's not done yet. Now, now you can lift it. Well done. Yeah. My name is Nomali Somsasiwa. I'm a farmer. And I am a tech entrepreneur. We have built a business called Fresh in a Box, which is essentially a data company, very much tech oriented. And we've built a lot of our solutions within the agricultural space. I became a farmer by mistake, but I found my passion. Why I do farming is because it follows simple logic. I plant something, I tender it, I care for it, and it grows and gives me money. I love the soft life, but there's also like a fulfilling effect of working with nature. It always gives you if you take care of it. I, I've, I've learned that over time. It's not an easy well, game, but it's fulfilling. I think I've made it to life. <laughs> oh, wow. Spending a day with Norma. Because everybody in Zimbabwe is talking about you. Really now? Jeez. <laughs> My name is Maya. Hi, Maya. An annoying village boy from Ghana oh. who's on a journey to change the negative narrative of Africa. Mm -hmm. But I really want to ask you a question. Yeah. Norma, do you think Zimbabwe's economy depends on farming? Depends, no. Um, realize, yes. This is the only country that I've been to that I'm seeing so many young farmers. Yeah. I feel like everyone is a farmer in this country. Everyone actually is, I think. Really? Yeah, but it's, 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 a, it's a recent revolution. So um, take us back to the time when um, we had the land reform mm -hmm. and um, we got into a space of not being the bread basket anymore to being the basket case, <laughs> some would say. And we, we started to be on a journey to see who should be doing the food production. Because I think they, we spent a lot of time not knowing who used to produce the food, right? And there's many of us um, African people who then said, okay, but we've been farming. We were the ones farming the land. Hmm. Why don't we continue that process? Hmm. And so it's been a revolution. But to see young people in agriculture, I think we've seen a lot of that happening pre-COVID, the first year pre-COVID, okay. all the way into during COVID time. The only thing that you could do, the only thing that you could do and not be locked down was be in the field. Right? So farming became the new thing, became the new profession. It was the only thing that was in the essential services because mm. people have to eat. Right now I am on a 10 hectare farm and I'm tilling 6.5. She's a big girl. <laughs> <laughs> there are bigger people out there. Here I how, how long have you been in farming? Um, for the last uh, four years now. So I didn't, I didn't start farming because I loved farming, hey. I'm actually a tech entrepreneur who uses solutions in the agricultural space, right? So um, my main journey into farming was from uh, Fresh in a Box, our okay. e-commerce site, hmm. right? And that e-commerce site, we work with uh, smallholder farmers, backyard farmers to bring together uh, vegetables, fresh fruit and veg, and we deliver to people's homes. And during that building, we ended up getting into a position where the farmers that were around used to follow trends, right? So like, Zimbabwe is a weird place. <laughs> <laughs> so there was a tweet that came out and said, this guy had like this beautiful Toyota D4D mm. with plastics and everything. And he posts out and says, I got this brand new car because I sold cabbages. Guess what? The following season, Everybody had cabbages. 
Mm. I'm a mathematics graduate from the University of Zimbabwe. Mm. I don't fall, right? I was like, I probably could hack a math formula, coordinate people to grow, and then it works out. The problem with being book smart is that it never actually translates to the practical smart unless you know how to do it. Then the universe was like, hey, I'm gonna send you somebody who's got a place. So then this place came about to be and then Ooh. I started farming. So I needed to learn how to farm for me to be able to actually work very well with farmers. Mama, were you born and raised in Harare? No, actually, I'm a Bulawayo girl. Oh, okay. Yes, it's the city of Kings. Um, it's in the south of Zim. And that's where I grew up. That's mm. where I was born from. Uh, I only came here for uni at the UZ. You ever left the country? To travel, yes. To no, I mean, no. to live in the country. No, 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 that would be my husband. Thank you for coming. Welcome to Zimbabwe. Thank you. How is life in Zimbabwe? Are, are you doing this with your husband or are you doing it alone? I'm doing this with my husband, but in the farm. Well, that's all me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so, so he's a what, great what, guy, but he's What is your husband you. doing to help you then? Okay, so my husband, I'd say he can sell ice to an Eskimo, pretty much. But he's, he's the brains behind the freshener box, the technology that we develop. Um, he's the guy that knows how to package it and sell it more understandably to people. He's very great with marketing and branding, you know. And he's, he's pretty much the superstar, but he's, you know, he shares his, 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 his limelight with me. So that's, that's more what he does. So I grow the veg, he sells the veg. The first ever business that we got into was Zoodies, Zimbabwean hoodies. And we're pretty much selling them online. And we're trying to like own some of our some of our realities in the apparel that we wear. Mm. So we had one Zimbabwean hoodie, and at the time we were very close to elections. So we had the um, MDC uh, ones, we had the Zano PF ones. We're just trying to, you know, um, make everyone wear whatever it is that you support, but then always remember in your mind that at the end of it, it's about being Zimbabwean. However different our opinions are beyond what government comes into place, we still have to put Zimbabwe first. And that, that was the whole idea. And that was great. But then it also lasted as long as the election. <laughs> as soon as it was done, we're like, okay, what to do next? Then came Fresh in a Box. And Fresh in a Box has morphed into like a lot of things. Just morphed into like a lot of things. The reason why I asked you this because of capital to start up a farm. You know, a lot of young, entrepreneurs out there keeps on complaining that I don't want to be a farmer because it's a capital intensive but you have done it so I want to know how did it all start where the funds came from with capital intensiveness of, of a farm that, mm. that's that's a reality of most of, of every farmer in the world right yeah. um, um, the Americas and the Europe's have got their banks, the, the federal banks subsidizing farmers, you know, because they have to produce food. And unfortunately, that method hasn't worked out well in, in Africa. We, if you look at how we, we've been doing this, right, mm. we haven't had access to loans because it, it's been difficult to try and find a loan when you don't own land. So for instance, I'm leasing this land. It's not mine. Right. So I can't walk up to the bank and say, hey, listen, I have been leasing this land for three and a half years now to four years. Um, please, may I please have some money and give me for 10 years, even if my lease does give me that long. Hmm. Right. Because any farmer needs at least about 10 years to like very well establish themselves. So it is capital intensive. We've built everything on this farm based on the profits of Fresh in a Box. So we've built very little. When we got here, we opened up that space first. And then we opened up the greenhouse sections. You see the greenhouses are not perfect, they're not plastic, it's just structures. So I'm literally farming on open land and it's not greenhouse, right? I would ideally love to be on greenhouse and just my still greenhouse structure requires about 22,000 to 28,000 US dollars to put up. My output would definitely shoot up. But even if I told that to a banker, 
They'll be like, that's a nice story to hear, but... But knowing that the economy of this country rely on farming, I guess there should be grants from the government to support young farmers or even farmers in general. So I think, okay, the government does have grants, right? Are they giving yeah. you some of the grants? No, 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 no. I was about to explain because I don't want, I don't want you to never not know the truth. The government does have a, it's not necessarily a grant, but it is a loan system. But the way it's always been structured is to look at the big commercial farmers. So remember Zimbabwe was made up of white commercial farmers. There were not many of them. I think there were about 500 of them. They could feed the whole of Zimbabwe and stuff like that and export. But now that there's many of us farmers, like I work with 2,800 plus farmers, right? Wow. And all of those farmers don't have big tracts of land, like 200 hectares. One has one hectare. Another one has got like 200 square meters and stuff like that. So it's not huge tracts of land in one place. Mm. It's huge land in different places mm. and the government only structures those kind of loans so it's called command agriculture you will meet maybe some of the farmers that we that i'm associated with from uh, my farmers union who are in that scheme and they'll tell you that it works for them because they have huge tracts of land that they are working on right so wow. those kind of grants work for them they haven't managed to figure out how to assist a smallholder farmer that is not necessarily a subsistence farmer the economy of the smallholder farmer has not been addressed. And I think that that's a role that we want to see government still get into. That's a role that we want to see private sector still support because 60% of the land in Zimbabwe is with smallholder farmers, like it or not, right? They're the stewards of the land, right? I'm, I'm the steward of the land here. But if I have no access to capital, there's no one who's designing a financial instrument for me to be able to farm. I will use my every, that's why I cry when I see somebody stepping on my 50 cent cabbage, <laughs> because that, there's a profit there mm. that I want to plant back mm. into the ground, mm. right? I'm going to build 10 times slower than my counterpart in South Africa, because their banking institution has figured out how to handle their different types of farmers. Right? I'm building slower than my counterpart in Kenya because it is the hub of capital right now in exactly. Africa. You know what I mean? The agri space, they have all of the money. Right? So that, that, that's the reality that we have. Do I think that government has got a lot of scope to work on? Absolutely. Have they done enough for the farmers? No. So here we're land clearing. We're about to prep. So we do a lot of intensive farming here because every plant that you see, for instance, we're growing a cauliflower. So this mm. one's in its infancy stage and it's gonna grow into something like this, right? Mm. But it takes 90 days. So I can't afford to have any land fallow because it means I only earn every 90 days. And I've been developing a system for me to plant 365 days and harvest 365 days so that I can at least earn every, every day, day for me to be able to sustain my workload and stuff. So you see that most people tend to farm something and then let the land rest and leave it fallow with the cover crop. We have to remove it. We'll clean up this area. By the time we go into the evening, there's going to be something else on the ground. So that we start. But the crops are not ready. No, these ones are done. It's done. But you've taken it off already. This is the fruit. All of this is done. Like, we're, we're done. Oh. This is over. Well, if you want to eat the green veg, great, but that's done. It's mm, over. How I wish this is uh, Ghana because this should be cassava. <laughs> we, okay. We, we hate the greens, man. We want the roots. You want the roots. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so that's going to be done. Why, why do I feel like your greenhouse is way different? They used to be different. No, I mean, what I'm seeing right now, it doesn't look like a greenhouse. A greenhouse that I know. <laughs> what happened to the roof? Okay, so this is the, the myth of not accessing capital, right? Oh. That's, the, that's the, it's the result of that. So you have greenhouse structures that used to be here, but you have to change the plastic um, for your greenhousing every five to 10 years. Mm. So when I got here, it was already like this. And I was like, no, we're going to put up greenhouse structures and stuff. We're going to know. And then you go and find out how much that costs uh, shitting this greenhouse would cost about 15,000 US dollars. dollars. 
Can I ask you a question? Yeah. What has been the major challenge since you started this farm? My biggest challenge was learning how to coordinate what I want out of my farm and having the people that I work with understand how intensive and fast moving we need to be. That's the biggest. Other, aside of capital, aside of pests and diseases, because that's very common in agriculture. We, we can't expect it to be different. Those are the things, just the coordination of how fast moving we want to be versus them acting fast. I think that, that was the biggest challenge since I started. But we're on it now. We, we get it. Finance is not a major challenge. I mean, it is a challenge. I just never want to always major on it because then I never get to do anything. Wow. It's, it's now a matter of fact that smallholder farmers don't access financing a lot in Zimbabwe especially. We're already country risk to be given money. Now that I know that, what am I going to do about it? I have to find another way. So that, that, that is not even in my challenges to tackle today. I'm, I'm not doing that. If I do get the financing, great. If there's an ad about, oh, smallholder farmers, grants, I apply. If I get it, awesome. If I don't, still good. We still have to do what we have to do to produce, to sell, and put the profits back in. What keeps you moving? Um, the big idea that I don't need to own greater parts of the land. I need to know how to use technology to help me be one of the biggest producers in the country. And like I said, I'm already working with 2,800 smallholder farmers. We make a total of about what? 300 hectares of land in total. That's huge amounts of land that we're intensively growing on. We now need to figure how to sustainably grow, use more biodiversity methods for us to continue having food. And we share into that wealth. So unfortunately, it's not 300 hectares of land and all of it goes to me. It's 300 hectares of land shared amongst 2,000 of us. And we see how we keep growing from that. Um, the fresh farm looks this small, but the real fresh farm is big dotted places all over Harare for now that produce for Fresh in a Box and deliver to people's homes every day. It's a good feeling, like seeing fruit like this is a good feeling. Seeing it go to waste like this is a lot of money. <laughs> a lot of money. That breaks my heart. <laughs> that breaks my heart, because this is like what? Uh, 90 cents a kilo. This is relatively almost a kilo. Hmm. It's a lot of money I could put back in, but it's the reality of farming. There is post harvest loss. Have we been in conversations about how we stop post-harvest loss? Absolutely, but we're still getting there. Do I think I would value add a, a, a cauliflower? Maybe, but like, it's like freezing it, right? Yeah. Um, and blast freezing in a place where you got here and there was no electricity. <laughs> <laughs> how do you irrigate so the crops? There's drip, drip irrigation, and I use overhead irrigation on the bigger part of the lands where we were. Thank you God need you to don't, pay me. You don't have a payment. <laughs> That's why. <laughs> Thank you for helping. We'll consider it charity. Because <laughs> if I have to pay no, you, no, you need no. a payment. Don't worry. This is a year of charity on my channel. <laughs> so it's all right. I'll do it for charity. <laughs> when you hear the name Africa, what comes to your mind? Um, great scope and defeat. I don't know why it's such an oxymoron. Whoa. You did ask what came to mind. It, it, it's an oxymoron in the sense that, you know how we always talk about Africa's got like a lot of potential, we have the most people, we could probably industrialize and be the richest continent. We are the richest continent on minerals, in terms of just our people. We are so adaptable, we're malleable, we do everything. The greatest countries in the world were literally built on the, blacks, uh, on the backs of black people and yet, there comes my oxymoron. We are still as many, if not more than the people that built the Americas, that built the Europe's, and yet we're failing to just build our own environment. Why is that so? I don't know, like, it feels like we need to be subjugated for us to be in a better position. If you look at all of our African countries, 
during colonialism, we were developing at a faster and better pace that when we got our independence, something turned. Like, why didn't we continue doing what we were doing? I think the education system was meant to teach us how to think. Like, <laughs> I, I never want to make excuses for why we as Africans are not doing the needful. Yeah. I, I want to always hold myself more accountable Double. than what my circumstances have brought me to. Okay. You know what I mean? So yes, there's a lot of issues. Like I told you, like if I ever used capital as my biggest challenge, yeah. I'll never do anything because I'm like, I can't start because I don't have capital. Yeah. And yet there's a lot of things that I could have done, I could be doing mm. enough for me to get started. It's going to take me longer, but who's in a rush in Africa anyway? I heard um, in Zimbabwe, when you grow corn, you have to sell it to the government. Okay, if you grow maize, yeah, but then th not this kind of small scale maize, right? <laughs> so this is sweet corn. It's a different type of corn. This one's more horticultural focused type of corn. Eat it with your meals, use it for brides and stuff. But if you're growing like hectic maize and you're on command agriculture, or you're on that subsistence farming and you have extra, you have to take it to the grain marketing board because the design of how we all feed each other is based on taking grain to the central grain marketing board for us to distribute food to each other. Remember what I said about if there was anything I could change about Zimbabweans, I would change our mindset. No matter how hard the government will try now, there's always somebody who's going to find a loophole, exploit it, and then make those uh, tries or gains fruitless and then somebody else is gonna like prosper big mm. and that's not the person's problem because we've had to deal with like very badly dealt hands for so long mm. that all everyone is thinking about is if it's not gonna be me and my people then Um, life in Zimbabwe is, 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 is a paradox, right? So um, I wouldn't be anywhere else in the world. I think it's a beautiful place. But at the same time, we've got our struggles. You know, like, like, like most African countries, you'll notice that, you know, there's uh, the, the gap between the haves and the have-nots is huge, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we're, we're, in a, we're, we're in a bit of a crux at the moment. You know, we're coming into an election year. The polarization in our nation is huge. We're living abroad. Yeah, I've, I've, I've lived abroad more of my life than I've lived here. So, so, so it's good to be home, right? It's, it's good to be in a place where I don't ever feel like uh, I have to check my visa. Uh, I, don't, I, 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 don't feel like I, I don't feel like there's any limitations in what I can do here, you know? Bro, a lot of us are looking forward to, I mean, live in the UK, US. You had all of that yeah. and decided to come back in here? Yeah. Is, is everything okay with you though? A lot of people say that to me, right? And I think I always try to explain to people that um, y y your home is best, right? Like, um, I, I, d I don't particularly like the weather in London. You know what I mean? It's very, very cold. I, I found myself very out of place in New York because there's a certain speed in capitalism that just sort of uh, dehumanizes me as, as an African. Wow. You move back to Zimbabwe, mm. would you say it's worth it? Yes, absolutely. I think for me, it's been really worth it. But I also must, I also must be very honest about my privilege, right? So um, I can do things because I went away, um, and with the exposure, and the experience, and sometimes even the wealth accumulated mm. overseas, mm. you can do better when you when you come home. So, See, I don't think a person who had stayed home could have, do what we're doing now, right? Exactly. Is, is so, that, will you encourage the diasporans to come back home and help rebuild Africa? The diaspora has a really huge role. If you look at countries like uh, Israel, for example, which, which are built off the backs of a very strong diaspora, who have made it a haven for their children to love going to Tel Aviv on the holidays and so mm. forth. I mean, this is what we must be doing as well as Africans, that, you know, when we come home, we should be enjoying the best, the, the, the fruits of the land, you know? Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm hoping, you know, a lot of diasporans will be there right now, cold and miserable and missing home and missing the food and missing the culture. And it's like, there's an opportunity to have the best of both worlds. And I really encourage people to, 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 to rebuild their nations, especially us Zimbabwe. 
Zimbabwe? If you had a chance to change one thing in Zimbabwe, what will it be? I would, I would, I would change the mentality of, of, of the leadership, right? And I think um, there, there is a, there's, there's a mentality that maybe is an African trait that does not gel well with capitalism. Uh, you know, the cronyism, the nepotism, uh, you know, tribalism, etc., etc. Those are the kind of things that are really bringing us down as a, na as, as a nation, right? And, you know, we would I would love a country that, 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 that worships and celebrates meritocracy mm -hmm. rather, than, rather than, oh, we're from the same tribe, we speak the same language, we speak the same, you know, we speak from the same totem. I would love a place where it says, this guy's really good at what he does, let him do it. And then this guy's really smart with numbers, let him do that, right? Because uh, right now we're being led by inept, um, inept individuals who are there purely because of patronage and purely because they fought a war that nobody uh, of our generation remembers. Uh, we appreciate, and I think the new war is the war with, with ourselves. The new war is the war of uh, how do we get out of poverty? How do we get into the 21st century? How do we get faster internet? How do we get, you know, uh, better, better technology and greener technology to save our planet? These are the new wars that we must be fighting. We cannot be fighting colonial wars in 2022. So we, we've been building an app that is called Let's Farm Africa, right? It's supposed to be a crowdfunding platform for smallholder farmers to be able to say, okay, this is what I'm doing. I want to do a greenhouse like this. I need $5,000 to get it up and running. I want to produce sweet peppers and tomatoes. In two seasons, I should be able to pay you back your money. Um, please guys, crowdfund for me. So, you know, put in your money. You don't have to put a lot of money from, five, from as little as $5 to maximum $500 and build that one farmer up. We believe that like by building those little cells, we're going to be able to create an economy where people can still land without having to suffer the legalities of having collateral and so forth. You know, I read about you, yeah? Where? No, you're all over the internet. That's why I'm saying <laughs> I'm a celebrity. You know, meeting you, I feel like I made it to life. <laughs> That's or nice. Not. I feel like I made it in life. Oh, come on. You're a political activist. Now we look towards our aging parents for help. When all of their pensions, savings and livelihood has been stolen from them at least four times in one lifetime. And I've started to realize that at the age of 27, I haven't even achieved anything close to what they had when they were 27. And now all I'm doing is to hope that a passport that I applied for ages ago could come out so that I can go and try and live my dream elsewhere as a servant in foreign lands. Yeah, I'm, I'm a conscious citizen. I don't like being called a political activist. I, I just have a really strong opinion when it comes to politics because I understand how it affects daily life, that's all. So conscious citizen more than political activist. Why and I'll take you, it. Why you started that though? When, when I was in uni, yeah? But I used to do student, student politics. University gives you a platform to experience the country or the world in a very contained form. And that kind of politics was heavily, heavily influenced by our national politics. Mm. So we could never like progressively have conversations on how we build a community or we build a, a nation within the university, bring out bright ideas without being clogged by the national politics. And that's why I got in there to try and say, let's, let's bring our smartness from university and build solutions for what we can then offer the nation because the national politics wasn't offering anything except for polarization. It was polarizing us. You stopped? Or are you still doing it? You know, I, I still have a conscious opinion. I've stopped making videos like No BS that I used to do on my YouTube channel because um, there's only so much you can keep reiterating. I think the things that I spoke about five years ago are still the same things. And it's absolutely disheartening for me to realize that I'm still talking about the same things and nothing is changing. And if I can't change it by having a conversation online, I need to do something else. Farming is my new activism. Food is political, you know. Um, what can I do to show results in that if I change what I'm doing right now, there's a way that I will influence the politics. It may not be a kaboom, big 
splash short of changing the politics. But I can definitely tell you that ever since we started the farming conversation in Zimbabwe, it's becoming the loudest and the loudest and the loudest conversation about Zimbabwe. That's why you can come in and say, would you say farming is Zimbabwe's backbone? And I say, no, but then it relies on it because mm. we've started that conversation and we've kept on amplifying it. Everyone wants to be a farmer and rightfully so because there's more tangible results. You can, you can see the results, it's no longer policy. You know the reason why we don't get results in terms of talking about politics? Yeah. Because I feel like the older generation are not ready to work with the younger generation. And it's everywhere in Africa. The collaboration is not there, you don't think so? Because I, I feel like if they can tap into what we have mm -hmm. and then work on it, just join forces together to help build the continent together. But I think they are not ready for this conversation, by the way. I, I, I think they want to have the conversation. We have an arrogance. As, as young people because of the internet, like the globalization concept has gotten to us. We have an arrogance to how we approach them. And I think the African society in how elderly people are treated needs to, they, they still want to hold on to that. Wow. And yet the way we want to bring our ideas and how we operate has a lot of arrogance to it. That's why we don't have that collaboration. And unfortunately for us to progress, we can't not be arrogant about the situation. Our ideas are pretty much very arrogant. And they have to be like that for them to be forceful, for them to move, for them to move the needle when it comes to certain things. And I think that's where our breaking apart is. We'll find each other. We'll find each other. I, I want to know, is it a lucrative business? Farming is a lucrative business. If you can explore, two or three parts up the value chain. We produce, we process and repackage, and then we deliver. Hmm. It is worth it when you look at it that way. If you do farming alone, for it to be a lucrative business, you need it to be at massive scale and you need government subsidy. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Is it lucrative for you? Yes. Farming is very lucrative for me. If it wasn't, I wouldn't be doing it. Fresh in a box in the next 10 years, I definitely see it as a juggernaut within Southern Africa in terms of how we use technology to develop spaces of agriculture and how we apply generally to everything that we do and connect it together. Being a, uh, a female entrepreneur in Zimbabwe is not an easy sport because I'm a mom too, so moms have got expectations to building homes. You don't, you don't bring the challenge the way I do right now and still manage to keep the home together. So you have to bring your 210% to make it all fit in. I, I have to trade off something. Sometimes my children don't get to see me as much because I have to do the needful to bring an entrepreneur. I have to give in my... Uh, 28 hours and 24 hours because that's what's going to put food at the table and that's what's going to make me a, a cut above the rest. But I have an advantage of having married the right person. My partner is the best complement to what we do. Our life is pretty much our business and our business is our life. So we know how to take it all in and never try and separate things so that we experience it all. We have it all in one basket and get the joys and the sadness of it all. I guess that's that's what that's the experience of a female entrepreneur in Zimbabwe.